Welcome back, you here at Goldberg. Today we'll be talking about the process of erasure. And you're going to go, why Huffington Post? Well, I promise there's a method to the insanity. I had a baby at 40 and it was awesome. One doctor had the gall to call me a geriatric mother. I wanted to punch him in his kidney. Okay. When I was 24, I told my boyfriend that he better get me pregnant soon because my eggs are going to shrivel up and die. For some reason, we didn't last. I wonder. When I was 31, I posted a Craigslist ad looking for a guy who fit a very specific description and wanted a family at 31, I wonder. Uh, I was weirdly lucky to find a fellow who was almost a perfect match, along with 300 some other gentlemen who sent assorted photos of body parts. So that gives you a sense of the modern dating market, that you got that many options as a woman, right, even though you're 31. And then she settles for a 23-year-old man. So... He can't even find someone a couple of years older. He has to go eight years older. I mean, this is brutal. But despite them kind of clicking, it took them eight years to even for her to get pregnant, assuming it wasn't him. And she has a kid when she's 40. So you go, what's the big deal? Well, let's stop and consider for a second. By virtue of her having a kid at 40, it means, let's say this child goes a little earlier with their own offspring, 35. Well, grandma is going to be 75 when the first kid's coming out of the womb. And then once the kid is 10 years old, more liable to pick up on lessons, traditions, whatnot. Granny's going to be 85. You guys go, yeah, but with modern technology, we're all going to be living to 120. Yeah, but with your five times booster AIDS injection, I'm not entirely confident. Although I wish you the best. Point being, you're pretty close to pushing daisies when your first grandchild comes out. Why does that matter? Well, let's consider it from the standpoint of what is a great-grandfather or great-grandmother or even a grandparent. What is that valuable for? Let's, let's consider. Going back to the Native Americans, once they had been beaten and placed on the reservations, uh, one thing the government did, and this was incredibly intelligent from a strategic standpoint, but they would take the children and say, you're going to be in a government school now. The purpose was to break the tie with the tribe and especially grandparents or parents because many of the traditions were not written down. They were oral or demonstrative uh, style things. And some ceremonies were prohibited, so they had to be done in secret. The point being, if everything's oral, after a very short period of time, you're going to forget it. You're not going to have a way to go and reference. And that's how you can cut off and erase a period of time, or at least you know, make it kind of cloudy. That's one small example, but today we have, you know, almost everyone in public schools. And they went from being really bad to just indoctrination camps to where you've got the majority population of young people who basically hate themselves, have no culture, uh, want to check their own privilege or reinvent their sexual identity. And I would not be surprised you start looking very weak connections to the grandparents and parents who had kids late because of a variety of reasons. The outcome, of course, is that you've got these folks who, they say they're individualists, but they're individualists all with the same collective mindset, where it's essentially devoid of any meaning. It's about, oh, I've got to chase clout on social media. I've got to pretend I've got this super unique existence, even though I'm not doing anything meaningful with it. And, you know, some of the uh, aftershocks, well, had a female relative. She was talking to this guy, not quite six feet, but little, a few inches under, not a bad looking dude, uh, has his heart in the right place, wants to be a father, has practical skills, like, you know, mechanic, fixing things, whatever, a handyman. And so that would be something that as a woman who is not quite at the wall, but certainly within a striking distance, you'd say, okay, maybe it's time to get serious. Well, you know when everything is aligned perfectly and then you go and find that one little petty irrelevant factor and you, you bank everything on it so that it can't be successful. That's what she did. Uh, and you say, why? Well, I've got to travel. I've got to be free. And you hear about them traveling and you're like, okay, you're going to travel so you can go to all the tourist locations and you can post pictures on Instagram to prove that you got this great life, even though it's not satisfying. It's not for yourself. It's about the internet.com. A lot of the men are no different, so they fixate on financial independence, retire early so I can travel, which I was just thinking it'd be hilarious if you hit fire 
like around February of 2020. And you're just like, what am I going to do now traveling? I guess if you got, again, your multiple AIDS booster injection. Uh, others turn to narcissistic stuff like Red Pill PUA game because they have no sense of like, okay, there's no purpose, right? I mean, the entire world's been set up to where it's almost, there's no reason to settle down. There's no reason to have a family or build anything because just focus on your money and like some vague sense of being free, which is kind of a, it's a little delusional in today's world to think you can actually be free in most cases. But uh, so where do you go from there? And, and what does it say about the importance of of your your past? Well, a grandparent or generally anyone who's older serves as a link to the past, to a time when the narrative wasn't entirely soyified or mitigated or just propagandized. So I don't know if you guys recall the uh, old Silver Chair miniseries, uh, or maybe it was just a TV show. I'm not entirely certain. Anyway, there's a character, Puddle Glum, and he's a marsh wiggle. So he's a little strange. He's got webbed fingers and eggs in his hair. But he goes on this adventure with Eustace and Jill Pohl. And at one point, they go underground. They meet the green lady, the witch. And she's trying to persuade these impressionable youngsters. She's going, there never was a world. There is no sun. It's just this light that I have. Uh, and... Uh, you know, Puddle Glum is obviously older. So Puddle Glum's a marsh wiggle. He lives apart from society. He's not affected by processed foods and drugs and mainstream media. And he says, I'm just paraphrasing, well, I, I should wonder, maybe our world isn't as, uh, maybe it is all a dream, but it's better than your own. And essentially, you can't change my mind. You're not going to tell me I'm crazy. I'd rather believe that dream, which in this case is true, than your invented fake reality of wokeism. Uh, so it shows you, and of course the kids, the public school indoctrinated ones, they get sprayed with a little mist and they, oh yeah, that's right, there is no other world. You start to see the importance of that generational tie. For myself, I had to undergo this whole process of deprogramming. Now, two of my grandparents died before I was really around. Uh, the other two, I knew them, but they were geographically distant and kind of from that culture where you don't talk much to kids which that can also be a problem. You have the elders, but they're just not terribly communicative. And then the aunts and uncles, old boomers who bought into the materialistic uh, nonsense, which a lot of millennials are doing, despite the conflict between both uh, communities. Nevertheless, I remember in media, in history books, in novels, in pretty much every facet of things that you come across as a kid, a group where I share considerable heritage with them, were always portrayed as these demonic monsters, mass murderers, whatever. This is insulting from several standpoints, and there's a good book, even though it is lefty liberal, it's somewhat insightful, uh, called America for the Americans. It talks about the disaster of the 1960s immigration reforms. But even before that, the way that this group was being treated in the United States by folks like Benjamin Franklin, and the fact that I think... It's the most common cited origin for Americans, right? Nevertheless, we see all this absolute just character assassination on a broad scale. So I had to read, I had to investigate, and in some uh, manner correct the record, which I did with some of the books that I've written and probably will write in the future. But it also dawned on me that the reason why, at least part of the reason why this group is always demonized might just happen to be that there is a particular population that was kicked out of Europe that tends to be communist-leaning, that tends to be uh, very much about its own interests, that holds great currency in the entertainment industry, in the music industry, in, the, in academia. They pretty much wrote the curriculums, wrote a lot of the books, and their students have carried that on. And I'm saying, so is this my history? Or is this your interpretation based upon your own self-interest and you want to protect your own position? You start going, oh, okay, it makes more sense now. It makes sense why you can take a majority population, they're going around like being sad about who they are and, oh, I have all this stuff to apologize for. And you're saying, isn't that remarkable? And maybe that's why if these people had, you know, connections to grandparents, if we weren't all having kids when we were 45, that it would be much harder to get all this indoctrination through. You know, no guarantees, but I'm just willing to bet. 
And that doesn't mean, oh, you have to go and have 10 kids for the trad community. But even if you are doing the fire thing, right? Even as an uncle or an aunt, being able to have a connection to your nieces and nephews to avoid all the, you know, paused soyification, that is a tremendous goal because otherwise, look at the world that we're living in and look at what's coming. It's brutal.